Good morning from Kingston. I'm out at Norman Rogers Airport and I'm going to talk about the history of the airport and explain the title of this video. One of our pilots is missing. As you approach the airport, you can't help but notice an aeroplane mounted on a stand beside the road. We'll hear more about that in due course, but we need to understand that Kingston has been associated with aviation for a long time. The local flying club was formed as early as 1929, and within the club there is a private pilot certificate for one Lewis Edmund Smith, bearing the number 378. Although they were staged at a different site, Kingston's first aerodrome, in the north of the city, Staged air shows that attracted thousands of spectators and featured dozens of aeroplanes as early as 1930. In July of that year, the airship R100 flew over Kingston on its way to Toronto from the UK via Montreal. When war came to Europe in 1939, the Anglophone nations of the British Empire were quick to recognise the need to train aircrew and the risks of continuing to do so in Britain. On the 17th of December, the Riverdale Agreement, signed in Ottawa, created the Commonwealth Air Training Plan to train air crew from Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK. 231 locations were selected for training in every province but Newfoundland, yet to join the Confederation. Kingston was amongst the 104 places selected to host an airfield, which had to be built from scratch with three 2,500 foot runways and associated supporting classrooms, hangars and other buildings. The legacy remains clear today, including two of the original five hangars and the outlines at least of the three runways, although one has become a taxiway. It's an extraordinary testament to the builders that these hangars are substantially sound, even 75 years on. Inside the hangars, little has changed. You can still see the original mechanism for swinging the doors. And in the workshops areas, there are even tool boards that were probably here during the war. The plan used 33 different types of aircraft. Amongst them, the Fleet Finch, Fairchild Cornell, and the Boeing Stearman. With the Avro Anson, the Beach Expediter, and the Bristol Bolingbroke, or Blenheim in British service, representing the twins. But the best loved, and indisputably most successful, was the advanced trainer known to Commonwealth nations as the North American Harvard, and by Americans as the AT-6 Texan, or SNJ. But it's time to talk about the men involved. A website created by the British Fleet Air Arm pilot, Jeff Agleton, gives excellent insights into training. He had initially joined the Royal Navy and volunteered for pilot training. Born in 1921, he was only 19 when he started basic training in Gosport, England, as an acting leading airman and officer candidate in September 1940. His first flight training was in Luton in November 1940 during the phony war period, but by February the 12th in 1941, he'd troop shipped to Halifax with onward rail move to Kingston and was undergoing familiarization on the ferry battle, in which he soloed a week later on the 19th. His training was complete by the end of May, Agleton then returned to England, where he completed officer training in Greenwich, followed by additional flight training before joining HMS Illustrious in March 1942, where he flew the Swordfish torpedo bomber. He would end the war flying the Marine Spitfire, or Sea Fire, and Fairy Fireflies. His long and eventful life ended in 2016. But let's return to that mounted Harvard at the airport entrance beside the Air Force Association building. It is an interesting and tragic tale to tell. In the early hours of September 23rd, 1943, another British acting leading airman, Geoffrey Fitton, just 20 years of age, was conducting solo night training. He had completed two circuits and took off on a third, never to return. His plane had gone down a kilometer west of the airfield in Lake Ontario. No cause was ever determined, and Fitton, who had escaped the sinking aircraft, was found floating by searchers some hours later, in his vest, face out of the water, but drowned. It's suspected that the waves had overwhelmed him. 
He was buried in Cataraqui Cemetery, where his grave can be seen today. His aircraft, this aircraft, lay on the bottom of the lake for 40 years, until discovered by local divers in 1983. It was recovered, restored over two years, and now commemorates the sacrifice of 44 men who died during training in Kingston, including the first base commander, Alexander Shackleton, who suffered a heart attack in 1941. Across Canada, some 800 airmen died in training, and their lives are remembered in the Ottawa Memorial dedicated by the Queen in 1959. The American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, described Canada in 1942 as the aerodrome of democracy. But before I finish, there's one more thing. Canada's last recipient of the Commonwealth's highest honour, the Victoria Cross, trained here in 1941. Robert Hampton Gray died six days before the end of the war, attacking a Japanese destroyer, the Amakusa, off the coast of the Japanese mainland in his Vought Corsair. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content, please click below and consider subscribing for more in the same vein.